Today, uh, people mock the idea of God's judgment. Slightest suggestion that a hurricane, an earthquake, a flood, or a rash of tornadoes might in some way be an expression of the judgment of God. That suggestion will get you laughed right out of the room. Even so, I confess this morning that I do believe the United States presently stands under God's judgment. More than that, I believe the judgment we stand under will grow increasingly severe unless we experience a spiritual revival, unless many in our nation repent and cry out to God. And why not? Why wouldn't the United States be subject to the judgment of God? Immorality is rampant in this country. A survey conducted in 2006 concluded that nine out of every ten people have sex before they marry. More than half the couples who marry today have lived together first. More than half the babies born to women under 30 years old are born out of wedlock. One out of four babies conceived in America today are aborted. And since 1973, more than 50 million babies have been killed while still in their mother's womb. In spite of the fact that God defines marriage as a lifelong covenant between one man and one woman, gay marriage has been legalized in 13 states and in the District of Columbia. And our federal government now deems these marriages to be valid and worthy of government benefit. On top of that, we are a materialistic and a self-centered people. We're a violent people. We are addicted to comfort, recreation, entertainment, pornography, alcohol, drugs, and sports. We define God the way we want Him to be rather than submit to God as He is. We've excluded God from our public life and we chastise those who dare mention His name. As a nation, we no longer read the Bible. As a nation, we no longer know the Bible. As a nation, we no longer accept the Bible as possessing any authority over us. In many American churches, God is not glorified. In many American churches, Christ crucified is not preached. And that's why I believe we as a nation do stand under the judgment of God. And unless revival comes, I believe that judgment under which we stand will become increasingly severe. Now, if that's right, where does that leave you and me as followers of Jesus Christ? Because make no mistake about it, when God judges a nation, He does not promise His people a free ride. When God judges a nation, believers suffer along with unbelievers. Those who know God suffer through that judgment along with those who do not. Are you prepared for that? Am I prepared for that? In the Bible, God's judgment against a nation can take many forms. Sometimes God judges a nation by orchestrating economic collapse. Sometimes God judges by means of natural disasters like earthquakes or floods or violent storms. Sometimes God judges by permitting civil strife, war, and violence in the streets. Sometimes God judges by sending a famine of food, or far worse, a famine of His Word. Sometimes God judges by heaping all these things together on one nation at the same time. So here's the question for those of us who cry out to God for justice. Are we ready for justice when it comes? What will we do if we lose our jobs because of God's judgment on America?
What will we do if our houses lie in ruins because of God's judgment on America? What will we do if violence and war or terrorism rocks our town and touches our families? On the day American prosperity is no more, will our faith endure? On the day our nation receives what is due, where will we find our comfort? Where will we find our hope? In the days of Isaiah the prophet, the people in Judah had to answer those questions for themselves. In Isaiah's day, the southern kingdom of Judah found herself under God's judgment, even as I believe we stand under God's judgment today. Judah's sin as a nation was ripe, and God's patience had run its course. And so in Isaiah 39, in verses 5 through 7, the prophet announces coming judgment to Hezekiah, the king. And Isaiah proclaims to the king, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day it shall be carried off to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The day of God's grace was passing away in Judah. The day of God's judgment was close at hand. Under the judgment of God, the cities of Judah would soon be leveled. Under the judgment of God, the economy of Judah would soon be destroyed. Under the judgment of God, the people of Judah would soon be violently cut down, and those who survived would be exiled, would be taken away, dragged out of their land with nothing but the clothes on their back. So how is it that in light of this severe judgment to come, the next words that come out of the prophet Isaiah's mouth are not words of despair. In light of the impending judgment against Judah, how can Isaiah 40 verse 1 proclaim comfort? Comfort my people, says your God. Comfort. In Isaiah 40, we discover that it is possible for God's people to find comfort even in the midst of his judgment. It is possible for God's people to find hope in times of despair. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. We just read in Isaiah chapter 39 how judgment is promised to Israel, to Judah. But even as God announces his judgment against Judah, in the same breath, he offers hope to his people. In Isaiah 40, God reminds Judah, and he reminds you and me today, that even on the day he executes his justice, he's still the savior of every person who puts their hope in him. And that's why after announcing impending judgment in Isaiah 39, the prophet immediately declares in Isaiah 40 verse 1, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. If it's true that the United States is already under God's judgment, and if it's true that more severe judgment may yet come, where will we find comfort 
as God's people in the midst of that judgment? Where will we be able to find hope if life as we know it in America comes to an end? As followers of Christ, we must find our comfort in the same place the prophet commanded Judah to find their comfort. We must find our comfort in the judge himself. We must find our comfort in God. Listen as we read Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Having just announced coming judgment, the prophet declares, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her inequity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. When judgment comes upon a nation, we who belong to God, we can find comfort because the God who judges is also the God who redeems. The God who judges is also the God who redeems. In Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2, what we discover is that judgment is not God's last word to his people in Judah. It's not God's final word. And it's not God's final word to you and me when he speaks judgment against our own nation. In these verses, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah promises Judah that in spite of their sin and in spite of the judgment that will come when they fall to Babylon... The day would come beyond that when Israel's inequity would be pardoned and the full penalty for her sin would be more than paid. And in that reference, Isaiah looks forward even to chapter 53 where he foresees the fulfillment of that promise of sin pardoned. When in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah proclaims concerning Jesus, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. Upon Him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. Where do we find comfort? When we hear the promise that God will judge our land. We find comfort in the knowledge that even if we suffer God's judgment on our nation, we will still not suffer God's judgment against our personal sins. Even if we suffer in our nation, as part of our nation, under the judgment of God in this world, we can yet take comfort in God's promise to every believer found in Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I need to ask, as we look towards what will very likely be harsh judgment against our own nation, do you personally know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you been forgiven of your sins through faith in him have you been redeemed because if you know Christ as savior you can take comfort in the midst of God's judgment against this nation 
Because ultimately, you stand redeemed in his sight. When judgment comes on our nation, Isaiah 40 tells us that we can take comfort because our God is not just a God who judges. He is a God who redeems. And second, Isaiah 40 reminds us that we can take comfort in the midst of national judgment because our God is coming to reign as king. Our God is coming to reign as king, guaranteed. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 8. Isaiah says, verse 3, A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. In Isaiah's day, when a king came to visit a distant region in his empire, the people prepared for that king's coming by building a straight and a level road for that king to travel on. And this is the imagery that Isaiah uses when he calls his people in Judah to prepare for the coming of the ultimate king, who is God himself. And so in the midst of judgment, Isaiah reminds Judah that the king of Babylon who would come against them, that king would not have the last word. Babylon too would be overthrown along with all the nations of the earth. God's final king is yet to come. And just like verse 5 promises, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Today we have the privilege of knowing the name of that king. His name is Jesus. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus rose from the grave to conquer death. Jesus ascended into heaven and even now reigns at the right hand of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is coming again as king? You may say, why should I believe that? Well, you should believe it. You must believe it. Because as Isaiah reminds us, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And even though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our God will stand forever. When God speaks, it will happen. It will happen. And so when God says, prepare the way of the Lord, we would do well to prepare the way of the Lord. When God says that all eyes will see the glory of the Lord together, the King is coming, and we'd best get ready for His coming. As a believer then, You can take comfort in the midst of whatever judgment God pours out on this nation. You can take comfort because Isaiah 40 promises that judgment isn't the end. For those who trust in Jesus, the judge is also our Savior. We can take comfort because our God is a God who redeems and we can take comfort Because when all is said and done, our God is coming to reign as king in Christ. And the reality that our God is coming to reign as king 
comforts us in the midst of national judgment because the God who is coming to reign as king is a God who has no equal. He is a God who has no equal. There is no one like him. If you're a Christian and you find that you are afraid of what might happen to you in this world, especially as judgment comes on our nation, if you're afraid of that, you need to stop. You need to stop and you need to soak yourself in these words that Isaiah proclaims in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 18. Listen to these words together. Follow as I read. God says to the prophet, Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold, your God. Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a sheep. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge? and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All nations are nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? And then look at verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Wow. According to Isaiah... How can we take comfort when God's judgment comes on our nation? In the midst of God's judgment, how can you and I not begin to worry about the loss of our homes, the loss of our money, the loss of our families, even the loss of our lives? How do we not worry? Isaiah tells us. Isaiah reminds us that the only way we can overcome the fear of God's judgment on our nation is by stepping back and remembering who God himself is. Should suffering come to you and me because of national judgment, 
Isaiah says, fear not. Fear not. Should judgment become severe, the prophet declares, behold your God. Behold your God. He is without equal. He is without peer. In Isaiah 40, verses 10 through 25, the prophet reminds us that our God is a God of perfect power. But not only is he a God of perfect power, he is also a God of perfect wisdom. Whatever he does is right. And not only is he a God of perfect power and perfect wisdom, he is a God of perfect sovereignty over the events and over the nations of the world. Isaiah reminds us that in creation, God demonstrates his perfect power. In creation, God demonstrates his perfect wisdom. Isaiah reminds us that in the rise and fall of kings and nations, God demonstrates his sovereignty over all that he has made. God has no equal. God has no peer. If Jesus is your Savior, and if God is your Father, no matter what happens, who or what is left to fear? Of who or of what should you be afraid? See, even when judgment comes, God still shouts out to you and me who belong to him, comfort, comfort my people. As followers of Jesus, we can take comfort in the midst of judgment because we know that our God is a God who ultimately redeems his people from their sin. And even in the midst of judgment, we can take comfort because our God is soon coming as the ultimate king. And as his people, we can take comfort in the midst of judgment because our God is without equal. He's perfect in power. He's perfect in wisdom. He's perfect in sovereignty. And if none of those things comfort you in and of themselves, here's one last thing you need to know. Our God who redeems, our God who is coming as king, our God who is without equal, our God has not forgotten, nor will he ever forget you or me. He's not forgotten you, and he will not forget. When the people of Judah mistakenly believed that God's judgment was a sign that God had forgotten them, or even worse, forever rejected them, listen to how God responds to them in Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. To Judah, God says... Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths, even those in the prime of their life, even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord, they who wait for the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I believe that the United States already stands under God's judgment. And I believe that apart from revival and repentance in our nation, more severe judgment is likely on the way. If that happens... Understand in advance that we who believe will suffer. We will suffer along with our nation. You know why? Because we're a part of our nation. And in the midst of that suffering, 
We need to be careful that we do not turn and say to God what Judah said. We need to be careful that we do not accuse God of forgetting us when suffering comes. We need to be careful that we do not accuse God of disregarding the promises he has made to us in Christ. Because the promise of Isaiah 40 verse 31 is not just a promise for Judah. The promise of Isaiah 40 verse 31 is also a promise for you and for me who know Christ. They who wait for the Lord, even through suffering and judgment, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Whenever judgment comes on a nation, God speaks to those people who belong to him. And in the midst of national judgment, God cries out to his people, comfort, comfort my people. Even in the midst of judgment and suffering, God says, we can. In fact, we must take comfort. We can take comfort no matter what happens. Because in spite of judgment, our God is a God who ultimately forgives and redeems his people from their sin. Nobody can take that away. Our God is a God who is coming to reign as king. Nobody will stop that from happening. We can take comfort even in the midst of judgment because our God has no equal. He is without peer. He's perfect in power. He's perfect in wisdom. He's perfect in sovereignty. But above all else, we can take comfort even in the midst of judgment and suffering because our God is a God who will never forget his own. And God will renew the strength of every person who waits on him. And God will deliver every person who believes.